<coughs> Hello, this is Mike Moyer, and welcome to the Slicing Pie Legal Clinic. Uh, we're going to be joined today by Clint Costa, who is a uh, attorney at Dugers and Birch. Hope I pronounced that right, Clint. Um, we're going to take you through some of the finer points of legalizing your grunt fund in the United States. And uh, Clint's going to do most of the talking today. I'm going to give you a quick, a quick intro on how uh, Clint and I got together here. And then we'll, of course, take questions uh, as they come in from the audience. Uh, this is Clint. I just told you a little bit about him. He is the what I would call the number one grunt fund friendly attorney in, in the United States. I send him all kinds of readers, and many readers have bought... Um, my sample agreement that I sell online and Clint uh, along with that offers uh, a one-hour consultation so I sell that agreement to readers and Clint helps them implement it so um, uh, it's been a great relationship and I'm really glad to have Clint today uh, he's done a lot of work the way I met Clint originally was uh, he published an article on Tech Cocktail about why uh, the dynamic methods while sounding interesting probably wouldn't work legally and uh, I point that out because this is kind of how it goes with most attorneys and may, maybe some of the folks out there listening uh, might find that uh, their own attorneys are skeptical of the slicing pie method uh, out of the gates and that's quite common. Um, I had an attorney once call me stupid to my face and tell me what my ideas would never work and a month later he got a copy of the book for everyone in his law firm. So what happens is uh, once people get their head around the concept they um, they see the, the merits of it, they see that it's inherently fair and they work to find a solution and all the legal issues that your lawyer um, will come up with has a solution and Clint will talk about some of those today. Um, Clint is a, a US based attorney. Um, I know there are attorneys all over the world looking at these uh, documents and trying to find ways to implement locally. Um, there's certainly efforts in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, they're going to be in Amsterdam next month and uh, there's, there's some efforts in the UK and Australia and Canada and in India and if you are an international grunt and you have an attorney that's working on this program with you we would help love to help you uh, find a way to, to to make it work in your own country and um, and then promote that contract so other grunts can use it so um, that's something that's important to me to make sure anyone can implement worldwide um, inherently uh, I I've originally promoted the book without needing a lot of legal agreements and, and you really don't but uh, as you move forward uh, and you really have something that has some teeth um, then you certainly should get some legal agreements in place and form your company. But most companies don't get that far. But uh, if they do, um, it's certainly a good idea to make sure you have your ducks in a row. Um, so take it away, Clint. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with Clint, and he will take it away from there. So, Clint, you can share your screen now. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, yeah, as Mike said, uh, my name is Clint Costa, and I'm an attorney at uh, Duggan Birch, which is a law firm uh, in Chicago. Um, and yeah, Mike and I have worked together for a little while on uh, slicing pie and um, setting up, helping people to, to set these things up and answer questions about them. So yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. So um, the first, uh, let me get to the top here. Here we go. Uh, Mike, can you see this? Yes, you're on the okay. air. Very good. All right. Um, so so yeah. As Mike said, one of the very first things I did was critique his model uh, in, a, in an article I wrote on Tech Cocktail, and then uh, got to know Mike, got to know the model, and, and really uh, enjoyed it, thought it was interesting, and now, you know, whenever I have an early stage startup that I'm talking to um, that's, you know, trying to figure out the age-old question of how do we split up equity, I normally point them, give them a link to Mike's book on Amazon and say, read this, and... Um, you know, think about it and, and let me know if you're interested in trying this. So I've uh, been a bit of a 180 and, and I think uh, well deserved. So, you know, slicing pie, the legal and tax issues, you know, one of the very first, I think one of the things that you know, is in the book and, and certainly that Michael Champion is the idea that you, know, you don't want to spend a ton of money before you know you have a viable company on legal and accounting and going back and forth on all these things and obviously so, so the dynamic um, uh, equity split uh, is is a is a good way to make sure that everyone's being treated fairly. Um, that said, you know there's plenty of people who feel like they're investing time, money, uh, resources, etc., and they want to have something in place. Um, so you know, as Mike said, he's got the the template agreement, which generally, um, you know, is is intended to generally work. Um, you know, along the lines of the book, 
Um, I don't think I've spoken with a single entrepreneur who didn't have an idea or a change to it or a twist on it. Um, and I think one of the one of the big things I always go back to when I t when I'm talking to people is to say, you know, we need to stick with the model. Uh, that's my that my primary advice is sticking with the model as it is in the book as Mike um, developed it um, to make sure that it's actually you know that the people are actually using the model as it was intended. Um, so that if it fails, it fails on its own merits and not because um, you know there were tweaks to it that didn't necessarily. Um, you know, yield the, the most fair result. So I'd love to interject right there, Clint. That's yeah. one of the number one places the system uh, falls apart is when people try, try to put changes in there. And in the book, I try to sort of uh, help people make some smart changes uh, in terms of partitioning and things like that. But I always promote using it as sort of as clean as possible. And in fact, a grunt fund friendly attorney is one who helps their clients implement as cleanly as possible. Um, I've had other attorneys who talk, them, talk their clients out of the model altogether, and I, I no longer promote them as grunt fund friendly. So, although you're always welcome to make your own tweaks and changes, um, just make sure you're very careful about it and work with someone like Clint who knows the implications of those changes. Yeah, for sure. So, I think you know the main issues that we're really talking about in terms of dealing with the legal and, and tax stuff. It's really, to me, it's three main things. It's the control of the company while the grunt fund is actually operating. Um, it's avoiding, you know, trying to avoid tax and the tax issues that pop up uh, when the grunt fund split occurs, and it's achieving um, the rules of the book, um, you know, generally speaking. So um, uh, the first issue is to control the company while the grunt fund is in place. So I think one of the very first issues that I normally talk with people about is whether or not you need a business entity. Do I need an LLC? Do I need a corporation to put the grunt fund into place? And the answer is no, you don't. Um, if you don't have a business entity, what you end up having is a, a state law general partnership, which means every state in the country, <coughs> excuse me, in the United States has a general partnership act. And basically, if you know two or more people go into business and do things that make it look like they're trying to conduct a business, um, by law, a, a partnership will be inferred there. And that partnership will be governed by the General Partnership Act, just like LLCs have an LLC Act in every state, and corporations have corporation acts in every state that lay out, you know, here's here's what a co partnership is, here's what an LLC is, here's what a corporation is, here's how they run, here are def here are some default rules that you can contract around if you want, um, but otherwise will apply. So that's I think the first takeaway is you don't need a business entity if you don't have one you'll ha end up having a partnership, um, which will be governed by the by the Partnership Act and that's you know it's 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 okay it just sort of depends a lot on um, you know your initial sort of the, of, of the founders um, comfort levels with sort of being governed by a default um, you know state law. Uh, which, which, you know, so, so, but this, what, what this allows you really is, I think, you know, primarily for very early stage startups that, in some cases, are really just exploring an idea, and where it's, you know, really premature. You don't need really a, a formal business entity. You don't really need liability protection. Um, you know, um, I've talked with with startups that are. Um, uh, investigating ideas, investigating markets. They know they're they're going to do a startup. They know they're going to do something. They're not quite sure exactly what they're going to do. You know, in that instance, you really don't need um, you know to spend the money on a business entity until you start going out and contracting and doing things with third parties where you put yourself in a, in a, a spot where you can possibly be liable to them. So, um, so first takeaway I think is you don't need a business entity. And then second of all, if you have one you really have two, two issues you have to deal with. So you say, okay, we, we want to do a corporation. We feel like this startup has a lot of potential. We think that it's going to um, uh, you know, be, be very fundable. We're going to get VC money, and we're going to take, take this to a billion-dollar valuation in 10 years um, or five years or two years. Um, so you make that decision. You say, we do want a business entity. Also, maybe we're going to be out... Um, you know, contracting and, and, and doing, um, you know, providing services or goods. And so we want to have that entity shield, that liability shield for the owner. So we're going to have a business entity. So the first question is, I have it here, is how much initial equity to grant? But I think <coughs> the bigger question or the bigger issue is um, how do you want the entity to run while the grunt fund is in place? Um, so, you know, the the... 
what you have to realize is that the grunt fund itself can be a um, a governance. I'll call it a governance um, uh, uh, structure. So you could say. From time to time, obviously, the business is going to need to make decisions, and so to, to that extent, we're going to kind of look and see where the grunt fund is at that time, and we're going to um, uh, vote based on that. So if you know one grunt happens to have 51% of the total you know, pie at that point, that person kind of gets to outvote everyone else. Alternatively, you could set that structure up initially. You could say, um, you know, I see this a lot of times in... Um, when I talk to people who, you know, it's an initial founder who's done a lot of legwork um, and has put a lot of time, effort, and sometimes money into a startup, and then they go recruit a team, and they say, you know, clearly I need to be the one making the decisions um, until at least until the grunt fund splits because, you know, this is my baby and this is what, you know, I need to be the one that's, that's you know, voting on things and making decisions. I don't want the control taken away from me. So in that um, instance... You know what I would typically suggest would be, if it's a corporation, that there would be a small number of shares that would be issued. So, and those shares would be, you know, totally unrestricted. They would be real, live issued shares um, of the company, and but <coughs> they would be the only ones entitled to vote um, on company matters. So you've got the grunt fund, and that's going, and um, everybody's participating in the grunt fund, um, but only one person actually at that point. Has actual, you know, voting shares, and that person then can carry the day in terms of making decisions. If it's an LLC, you would do the same thing with percentages. So, in the same example, you have one founder and two other grunts who are going to be participating in a grunt fund together. That one, the the main founder might have, you know, eight shares, and the two grunts may have one share each, just to bring them into the fold, allow them to kind of, you know, have an ownership interest in the company. It's going to to change um, when the grunt fund splits, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> the uh, main founder who has eight shares has a, obviously a vast majority and has the ability to um, do the, to to vote and essentially control the company. Same thing with an LLC; you might do something like uh, ninety-eight percent for the main founder, one percent, one percent for each other one. But uh, it sort of just depends on the on the on the company and on the founders. Clint, I'd love to interject here too because this is an issue that comes up a lot. This whole um, question of control. Um, you know, in, in the grunt fund will put in put the person in control who deserves to have control, um, from an equity standpoint. But there's always this sort of founder wants to maintain control, and this is a great way to do it. Uh, at the end of the day, the grunt fund should determine who gets the proceeds of the sale of the company if it sells, or what percentage of profits should they get if the company distributes profits to shareholders. Um, the control issue could, could be a little bit separate. Um, but I always want to tell people that if, you're, if your decisions are so unpopular that you have to have a majority shareholder to stake to, in order to get them passed or get them through, your company probably is doomed. So most companies are collaborative anyway, so don't get too hung up on the control issue. Um, do a few things like Clint's describing, but don't get too hung up on this because uh, you need to be make, making collaborative decisions anyway. Yeah, and I agree with that. And practically speaking, that's why you know there's a lot of things you could do to maintain control. Um, but practically speaking, you know, my thought is to do the, the most simple thing because at the end of the day, if you need to rely on some mechanism for, for day-to-day decisions, you know, you, you might have a, you're going to have a problem in your startup anyway. Um, it's, a, it's potentially the case that you know, there may be one key decision that everyone's split on and you know, as a founder you need to be able to make that decision, um, but I think that's pretty unlikely. The other, the other um, issue here in terms of control the company while the grunt fund is in place and working is do you have a do you want to have a comprehensive agreement now or later and again this deals with governance but it deals with a lot more than that so you know um, oftentimes people refer to this the, these types of agreements as founders agreements technically speaking if it's if you have an LLC the agreement among all the owners around how the company is going to run and all those things is the operating agreement and on the on the corporation side you would have a shareholder agreement <coughs> excuse me and then again, if you don't have anything, as we kind of discussed, you don't need a business entity. Um, if you don't have a business entity, you have a state law partnership, um, and that there's a there's a partnership act that would tell you what the rules are. The same thing is true with LLCs and corporations. So if you don't have any additional agreement um, among the founders, and you have say an LLC, at the end of the day, 
the the rules that deal with things like meetings, voting, um, uh, sharing profits, all that sort of stuff, all of that exists within the LLC um, statute. So you you, you kind of have th- you know two options if you do a business entity. You have to make a decision, do I want to just rely on the state law default or do I want to have an operating agreement or a shareholder agreement? Um, you can have one now. So you could say, okay, before, as we go into the grunt fund, um, we want to have an operating agreement set up among all the founders um, that will be applicable you know, not only now while the grunt fund is in place, but will also be applicable afterwards that once we've done the split. Um, or you could say, we don't want to have anything in place and we're just going to kind of go with you know, what we need to, to do. I think it's just one thing that's important to note is that, and I get this question quite often, <laughs> is that um, if you if you have a business entity, the Grunt Fund agreement really only covers you know the Grunt Fund and the creation of the Grunt Fund, how it's going to work, and how it's going to issue you know equity out. It does not deal with things like voting or calling meetings or you know all of the sort of um, Oftentimes boilerplate, but but potentially important things that you'll find in an operating agreement or a shareholder agreement. So so oftentimes those two things need to work together um, in order to uh, uh, give you sort of a full picture if you're of the type that wants to have sort of a, a you know even even basic but comprehensive sort of governance structure to your to your entity while the grunt fund is in place. And uh, Clint, I just I want to let people know that I do have a version of the contract on my site that is an LLC operating agreement that incorporates the Grunt Fund terms into the LLC operating agreement. The uh, the more universal approach will work with either one, but uh, uh, you can you can take a look at that if people are interested. Yeah, and either way will will definitely work. So, um, so the next issue is avoiding tax on the Grunt Fund split, or trying to you know be tax wise basically. And um, so, you know, basically here's the issue. The IRS, the tax code, always assumes that equity is split up front. You know, that's the basic underlying theme of, of, um, of our tax code is that people get together, they split up equity when the value of the company is very low or nothing, and, um, you know, that's all fine. And then they go forward and they create value. So obviously what... Slicing pie and what the grunt fund model does is, is sort of turn that on its head, and it, it grants equity. You know, arguably it grants equity um, when the company already has potentially some value. Now, I think it's important to note on this point. You know, startups, um, even when you can get you know from a, an investor a one million, five million, ten million dollar um, valuation for investment purposes. Um, that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, run parallel to your valuation evaluation for IRS purposes, right? An investor is looking at, you know, potential is looking at the founders is, you know, probably thinking about some, you know, has some warm fuzzies, so to speak, some intangibles that the investor is looking at in, in making a decision about investing. And at the end of the day, the um, the the valuation is really sort of a function of how much does the investor want to invest and how much dilution are the you know the the founders willing to accept and you kind of to me oftentimes you back in back in to an acceptable valuation number um, so it's important to, to, to realize though that oftentimes oftentimes or from an investor and you know, you you. I think a good example is often what's not to get too far afield, but what's often called a 409A valuation, which is, you know, you you bring in investment, and you um, you take some of that investment, uh, and you you go hire a lawyer and you set up a stock option plan because now you're going to take some of that Series A and you're going to go hire a bunch of people and they're going to want stock options and equity in a company. So what ha- ends up happening is. Um, you take investment and then you go get a formal valuation of your company and those two numbers are very 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 different almost all the time so you might have gotten a ten million dollar valuation from your series A investor and then you go to a, an accounting firm or a valuation firm and they'll give you a you know a, a, a less than a million dollar valuation um, the difference is in how the IRS views value versus how an investor views value 
So the way the IRS views value is a very traditional, you know, net discounted net cash flows, comparable sales, and book value, which oftentimes a startup, especially one that's early stage, is not going to have any comparables, is not going to have any book value, meaning assets on hand over liabilities, <coughs> assets that you could actually go sell in the market. Um, and discounted net cash flows, usually most startups don't have any value um, from that perspective because they don't have net cash flow from operations. So, Clint, I want to you know, uh, bounce another thing off you that I, I heard from the IRS directly um, that, that I think might be relevant. Um, they may also value the shares based on what was exchanged for them. So if I give you a year's worth of my time, and my market value is $100,000 a year, the IRS is going to think that one share is worth $100,000. So generally speaking, that would not be the case. So there's, I think there's an exception. There's a, there's sort of a, uh, an, an issue there to talk about a little bit, but. Generally speaking, if I receive, you know, if I receive compensation in the form of equity, um, my compensation, the amount of compensation that I've, I've received that I have to pay taxes on is based on the value of what I've received. Um, to do it the other way is, is, would be really tough from a policy standpoint because um, taxpayers could argue all day that they're worth less or more and, you know, how does the IRS really peg that? So, so generally speaking, from an income tax standpoint, the value of, um, of something that is received on account of services um, that, that someone has rendered is valued based on the, the value of the property that that person receives, not the value of the services that that person rendered because it would just be too difficult to value those services. Now what I would say is that you know, you might, you, there may be an issue there where IRS says you know this company must have value because you're a you're an important guy. You could go make a hundred thousand dollars on the open market, and you worked for the startup for a year. Um, so therefore, we're gonna we're gonna say that we think there's value there, and because what rational human being would work would do that? Um, so we we think there is value, and we're gonna try to prove it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know I think that's an argument IRS could make, but generally speaking, you know I think IRS toes the line on in terms of you know, they, they never, you know, if IRS tried to, to take the values that investors are giving um, and say that's what the company's really worth, uh, th there would be a, you know, I think there would be a major chilling effect and there would be a lot of people in, in various startup hubs around the country that would be paying a lot of taxes or be fighting the IRS pretty hard because, um, you know, it's just sort of accepted that the IRS doesn't put a lot of stock into those investor valuations. So all that to say, um, you know, the, why am I talking about this? The whole idea is, you know, the grunt fund typically, you know, I think will split and people will get their equity at a relatively early stage of the company. And oftentimes, even a, a somewhat mature startup that, you know, may even have revenue, um, but, but probably not profits, you know, is, is likely to have little value lower value. So, so you know, it's just something to think about a little bit, but, but at the end of the day, you know, there could, the IRS could come back and say, oh, no, 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 this company had a lot of value. Look at this, you know, 12-month projection, um, you know, <coughs> it received all this, this uh, investor interest, etc. cetera. Um, so we're going to say it has value. And then you end up having a fight, which is not something that anybody's going to want to do with IRS. So at the end of the day, you know, it makes sense to attempt to um, you know, go against this, um, you know, in terms of how the grunt fund works in really providing the equity at a later stage when there's a higher probability that the, the company has value, um, there's, there's, you know, it makes sense to try to, you know, structure around that. And so, um, so here's what we do, um, you know, generally speaking, the, for corporations, what we try to, try to use is this concept of restricted stock. So what is restricted stock? Restricted stock is stock that a, an employee receives um, that is subject to vesting, right? So the common sort of thing that everyone thinks about is, um, you know, time vesting. So, so you know, you receive shares of stock <coughs> directly. Um, you, re you receive 1,000 shares of stock in, the com in a company, um, and those shares are subject to time vesting, you know, a two-year 
you know, two-year cliff. So you have to go two years before you start vesting into anything, and then you and then you vest at two years into half um, of your of your stock, and then two years later at the four-year mark, you vest into the rest. You know, and you do that maybe ratably over two years, you know, per quarter, whatever. I mean, you could do a million different ways to do that. Um, what what you can do so you know our default rule is that if you get something under the tax code if you get something um, in in exchange for performing services which you know basically everyone who receives stock in a startup is receiving that stock on account of services either rendered or to be rendered um, the IRS says what's the value of that stock you have income in the in the in the amount of value of that stock that you received that's the default rule now. Um, when stock is subject to vesting, you actually have, there's a hiccup to that rule. So what's the hiccup? The hiccup is I received stock on day one. I received 1,000 shares of stock. Because my stock is subject to vesting, what the IRS says is that there's actually no guarantee that you're going to receive that stock, and so we are not going to make you pay tax on that right now. Um, we're going to make you pay tax when you actually vest into the stock, and so that it's when it's when when you actually have it, when it can't be taken away from you any longer. Um, so so that's the 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 default rule um, when there's vesting. So so there's a couple rules just to to reiterate so we don't lose anybody. If you receive something like stock in exchange for services to be rent that you're going to, to provide. So you start working for a startup, you get 1,000 shares of stock on day one. Generally speaking, the IRS is going to say, what's the value of that stock? If whatever the value is, you pay, you pay tax on that. That's considered income. A twist on that rule is if you receive stock on day one that's subject to vesting, the IRS says, oh, your stock is subject to vesting. Hold on. We're not going to measure the value of that stock today. We're going to measure the value of that stock when you vest and, and as you vest. So in two years, when you vest in that in half of your stock, um, we're going to take a look and see how valuable the stock is. You'll pay tax then. Sounds great. Except that in two years, hopefully, the stock is worth a heck of a lot more than it is worth today. So... Um, the, the, the general wisdom is that if I receive stock in a very early stage startup that <coughs> you know, likely has no value, I should make an 80, what's called an 83B election um, the, the minute I receive that stock. So what, what is the 83B election? The 83B election is, again, we're in the scenario where I've received stock on day one of my, of my being with the company, and the stock is worth nothing. And I know that in two years, I'm going to vest into half of it. And at that two-year mark, that's when IRS is going to say, okay, we're going to see what the stock is worth now. Right? That could potentially give you a huge tax bill because today the stock's worth net zero. In two years, hopefully the stock is worth quite a lot of money. So what I can do is I can short-circuit that IRS rule, and I can make my 83B election, and I can say, no, 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 IRS, you know what? Even though my stock is subject to vesting and I may never get it, I want to pay tax on my stock today. I want you to take the value of the stock today, and I want you to charge charge me taxes on that on that value. So, Clint, uh, I got a question here from Joe, who says <coughs> he's been in business for three months, and he's wondering if he should file the eighty three B election upon implementation of the grunt fund. Um, it seems like timing is an issue here. And how would he yeah, go? So, how, how does he do it? Um, so the 83B making the 83B election actually requires um, it, it requires a 30 days from the grant of stock. You have to make the election, and there's a bunch of other um, sort of administrative requirements. And I would highly suggest if you're making an 83B election, there's actually a lot on the internet about it. But you can find you know there are CPAs galore that will file these things. For you very inexpensively, and that way you know it got done correctly. Because the if you don't do it correctly, the results can be disastrous. In terms of an operating company, you know, the um, uh, let, let me answer that question kind of as we get through and, and see how this all works with the grunt fund, because I think it'll become more clear. So you know, as we said, basically, you know, the 83B election allows you to short circuit the normal process and allows you to pay tax now, today, on stock you don't necessarily have. You have not vested into it, but you you are scheduled to vest at a later time. And, and so what you're saying is I want to pay tax now on the low value versus 
tax later on the high value. Um, obviously, the you know if if the company is actually worth something today, um, that's a tougher decision because you may be paying tax. You know, when the company's worth zero, it's really easy to say I want to pay tax on zero. Um, if the company has been going for a little bit and has value, <coughs> excuse me, um, it can be. It's definitely a more difficult decision to say, okay, hey, I want to pay tax right now, even though that may be, you know, a, not a huge but a, a material amount of money. Um, because here's the catch: if you file the 83B and you either never vest into the stock because you get fired or you leave. Um, or the stock tanks and it's worth nothing in two years, or it's worth less than what you know the value is um, when you make the 83B election. You don't get to go back to IRS and say, "Oh, you know what? I paid tax on this and that didn't work out. Can I get my money back?" You're making a, a hard choice at that moment, you know, as to what to do. Okay, so that's just to kind of explain how does the 83B uh, election work um, generally, and so how does this work with the grunt fund, right? So. In the Grunt Fund, I think, legally speaking, nobody is really granted equity, nobody is really granted stock, if you're in a corporation, um, on day one. You're, you're participating in a Grunt Fund, which at a later date will entitle you to some percentage of the overall ownership, you know, which would be you know, um, uh, represented by a certain you know, uh, number of shares of stock. So the potential, you know, the potential solution <coughs> is at on day one. Let's let's think about our three-person startup company. On day one, all three of those founders would receive ten thousand shares of restricted stock. The stock will vest when the grunt fund splits. We don't know when that's going to happen. We know at some point the grunt fund will split. We're gonna, well, you know, we'll tally up all of the. Um, We'll tally up all of the hours and time put in and money and everything, all the other inputs put in by everybody. We'll divide by the by the theoretical value of the entire uh, fund, and then we'll know person one is entitled to 20 percent, person two is entitled to 30 percent, and person three is entitled to 50 percent. Okay, well we that's we'll know that in the future. So a potential solution is issue. We could issue um, 10,000 shares, a round number. Really, the, the number of shares doesn't matter. But let's say let's call it 10,000 shares of, of restricted stock would be issued or could be issued to each of those three people. And the vesting mechanism on that stock, that stock will vest when the grunt fund splits and the number of shares that each person will vest into will basically work with or will sort of comport with um, the percentage ownership that they should have. So in that example, in theory we've, you know, you could work the numbers any number of ways, but, but something you could do is say, okay, in that same uh, scenario where we have uh, one person at 20, one person at 30, one person at 50, each person got 10,000 shares of restricted stock. Um, person, the, the person with 20 uh, percent would vest into 2,000 shares. The person with 30 percent would vest into 3,000 shares. The person with 50% would vest into 5,000 shares. The unvested shares go away. It's like they were never, you know, uh, never issued. Um, obviously, there's a lot of sort of legal wrangling and stuff that you have to do to make this all formal. But that's the general idea. <clears throat> and um, in your experience, Clint, how often how have people often chosen this option? This option? Um, I think, generally speaking, when people do corporations, they do this. Because here's the thing: I don't know. I don't know of another way to avoid to to really avoid or try to avoid the issue that could pop up where you've done a grunt fund for a year, you've had tremendous success and traction with your company, and the company does have a real value. It's got profits. It's got um, you know you have assets on the books. The company has a real value, and now you're issuing. You're actually issuing stock. When it was unclear all the way up to the time you issued it, it was unclear what each person would be entitled to. I don't know of, a, of another way to do this um, to, to to make that grant of stock when the grunt fund splits um, to try to make it tax free, as, a, as it should be. We have a question here. What is meant by split? split. So the split is the, the moment in time where the grunt fund ceases, 
we stop counting up everybody's inputs and we simply say, what are your inputs, you know, in relation to the total value of all inputs? And so, therefore, what is your percentage ownership? And we'll talk about the split and the sort of uh, some of the the, the you know uh, factors that would lead to the split, some of the the events that would lead to the grunt fund split. <coughs> we have another question about vesting. Where vesting is used, is it a cliff or gradual vesting? Um, the vesting is a all at is an all at once vesting. Um, that 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 uh, happens when the grunt fund splits. I mean, you so could do it so periodically. You just issue you more shares over time. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could over time. Yeah, I think I, I don't know if the calculations become more difficult because then what happens if you know if you vest into a certain number? I guess you could just continually be issuing restricted stock. But you know, I think the the issue here is what you really want to do is you want to issue the stock and get the 83B elections on file. Like, as soon as you know you're going to do a startup, when the company has no value, that's the safest. The safest thing to do, you know, I, I think generally is you you want to get that stock out, even though it's restricted. You want to get that stock out, and you want to make your 83B elections, um, because you know if is, is the the longer you wait in a startup, the longer you wait to to actually get the stock out and issue it. Um, the more likelihood there is that there could be value in the company that the IRS would say, you know, well, there was value, you know, when you, I know you were kind of an owner all, all, all along, but you never had a, you know, sort of a legal right to the stock, and now you're issuing it a year later, and the company has, you know, value. So I think the safest thing to do is to just issue some number of shares and <coughs> figure out, based on when the, uh, the grunt fund splits, how many shares you should actually vest into all at once? That that would be my goal. There may be um, there may be some arguments to be made about like a gradual vesting. I just I guess I haven't thought of it. I don't know exactly all the all the um, kind of all the nuances to how that might work. So so that's corporations. Um, you know, generally speaking, that would be the solution, the the the, the possible solution for corporations for this. Um, you know. Okay. Other, yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. Another question here, Clint. Clint, um, uh, can you make an 83B election if you don't have a legal entity already? Um, no, you can't because you're not. You know, there's no stock. You have to have stock. You have to have. Well, you have to have. Um, you know what? I take. I think maybe I take that back. I'm sorry. The. I believe that 83B probably applies generally to ownership interests, and so. You know, if you, you know, the, the issue is um, there's another way to do it. So for, for entities that are taxed as corporations, you kind of need, to, you know, I think the 83B solution is the one that, that probably works the best. If you have a different type of, if you don't have an entity at all, and so therefore you have a state law partnership, you fall under partnership taxation, which all LLCs do as well by default. And so... And, and my next slide talks about you know what to do kind of solution for LLCs or you know more broadly speaking for partnerships. Okay, and then another question coming in is: Does calibration of the grunt fund result in multiple splits? Do you know what calibration means? Are you referring to Clint? Um, that's when you kind of adjust the base value to reflect some time that's already been put in. Oh, I see. Um, I don't. I don't know that it would lead to multiple splits. I think I don't think it should you know, either. It just it just yeah. it's whatever you determine it's what the grunt fund should do. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I often have I talk to people who, um, you know, ha you have put a lot of time and effort into the company prior to you know recruiting grunts, and they say, well, I want to make sure that you know my um, time and effort is ta is compensated in the grunt fund. Um, and so I think you can do that um, by just starting your theoretical value at more than zero, um, you know, subject to following the rules of the book and um, in terms of how you're measuring that and, <coughs> um, you know, getting agreement from your uh, the other grunts, you know, um, uh, you can, you know, I think you can, you can, um, uh, you can, 
you know, have a higher value to start out with, so you're being um, compensated for what you've already put in. But I don't, I don't think you would do a split to get to zero, and then do it. You know, I think you would just that would be you would just use that, you know, those amounts that you've earned um, previously to you know move forward um, in in the grunt fund alongside everybody else. We have another question from Roberto talking about that LLC does, doesn't need to comment. The LLCs don't have stock, they have units. I think you might get to that in our next section, right? Yeah, so we're in the section now. So that was the corporate, you know, that was the corporate uh, uh, issue or the corporate, you know, potential solution. Now we're talking about LLCs, right? So LLCs are taxed as partnerships. Um, and so are state law partnerships. So this would apply as well if you choose not to have a business entity at all um, and you just you know you have a, a just a general partnership one of the nice things about LLCs that are taxed as partnerships or generally partnership taxation is that it's very uh, fluid and it's very um, it is very um, flexible and so along with that you we actually generally speaking we don't have to go through all of these you know sort of machinations uh, around Issuing stock, making 83B elections, you know, having the the vesting of the stock be tied to the grunt fund. Um, in partnerships, and I'm going to be real high level. There's a lot of details to this, and they you know would apply to different situations differently. But generally speaking, in partnerships, you can simply um, change the 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 ownership percentages however you want at any time. And again, there are there are <clears throat> some substantive um, um, limits on that, um, especially as it relates to sharing losses going forward. But generally speaking, if you set up a grunt fund in an LLC and you know everybody gets some initial percentage, even if it's the, the strong founder scenario where you have the founder with 98% and two grunts with 1% each, if you go through the grunt fund, and everybody earns their, you know, theoretical value <coughs> and their percentage. Um, when it comes time to split the grunt fund, and the percentages turn out again to be that, let's call it the same 20, 30, 50 that we've been talking about, you can you can simply just change everybody's sharing percentage going forward, and you know you can just do it. And there's no tax effect. There's no, you know, compensatory effect um, like like there is with um, uh, let me let me qualify. There doesn't need to necessarily be a compensatory effect like there is with corporations. You can structure around it. Um, it takes a little bit of doing um, in terms of how the operating agreement is drafted, but it, it's possible to do that. Um, as an aside, you know, after the grunt fund splits, it's also possible. You know, two scenarios: one in a corporation that has some value, one in an LLC that has some value. In the corporation, there is there is actually no way I, there's no way that I know of to to give someone shares of stock in a corporation that that you know objectively has value, without that person um, having taxable income based on the value of the stock. Um, in an LLC that's taxed as a partnership, you know you have a you have a. a, a a company that has value and it's an LLC, um, there's something called a profits interest which can be given. It's a it's a go forward interest in the profits. It actually has for tax purposes, as long as you follow the rules, it has no value. So that's just to highlight and illustrate the fact that LLCs are just much more flexible. And um, I would say for people who are, you know, I often whenever I suggest LLCs the 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 common typical you know reaction from some people typically I think LLCs are, are very popular but from some people is well but you know we have a company that we're really gonna uh, blow out in terms of investment and it's really gonna be a big thing and we're gonna get VCs and they're gonna want to see us be a corporation and I would say that <clears throat> with an LLC um, you can you can change that into a corporation generally speaking you do that on a tax free basis. Um, the same is not generally true of corporations. Um, the facts, the facts and circumstances have to be just just right for a corporation to be can, to be transferred to a, an LLC or a partnership with no tax effect. Um, 
which typically those facts and circumstances won't be won't be around in a successful uh, successful business. But if you start as an LLC, yeah, it's going to take some you know some a little bit of legal work to tr to switch it over to a corp. But you know at the point at which you're about to bring in an investment and your investor is demanding that you be a Delaware <laughs> a Delaware C corp, um, you know the LLC um, uh, can be tran can be turned into that, and you don't. Now, you don't really have to worry about taxes. The other thing is, as I'm seeing more and more, LLCs, not, forget tax standpoint, just from a, a governance standpoint and what you can do with them, they're kind of like a blank slate. Corporation has a very you know, sort of stiff structure that you can contract around some things, but generally speaking, you, know, you have what you have. You have a skeleton. In a, in a corporation, you have a skeleton, and it's a, defined, you know, it's a defined skeleton. It looks like a human. You can put a hat on it. You can you know, put a tuxedo on it, whatever you want to do. But it's going to look generally like a human, you know, what, no matter a human skeleton, no matter what you do. With an LLC, you could literally mold it, ply it. It's, it's really like Play-Doh. And so, um, you know, th this would be generally speaking, when I talk to people about putting a grunt fund together, I think doing an LLC makes the most sense, not only for the grunt fund, but also going forward until you, you know, literally have an investor saying, "I will not invest in this company unless it's a Delaware C corporation." Um, and I would even say, you know, you're seeing more and more investors that are, are willing to do deals in LLCs. So uh, for sure, angel investors are willing to do them. And, and, and you're starting to see, I think, some um, more uh, formal uh, uh, institutional investors that are willing to do those. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Clint, <laughs> but one of the features of an LLC that investors like is not only can you allocate profits wherever you want, you can also allocate losses wherever you want which could have tax yeah. benefits for an investor. Exactly. The losses, so you get start getting into ver almost what I would call, say are, is the, basically the most complex area of tax law is, is the, um, the sort of different sharing of losses um, by, with investors. Um, you see that a lot of times, like the, where that all kind of came out of was real estate. So oftentimes the, the, money, the money in real estate was saying, um, we'll give you the money. We know that you know this isn't really going to turn a profit for a while, and then we, maybe we won't even see any money until we sell the project. But in the meantime, we want the losses because we're successful investors, and there's going to be all sorts of losses in here, and we want them all. Um, and generally speaking, yes, you can do that. Um, like I said, there's some some tax issues you have to deal with there, but um, you know that's a general. Generally, you can do that. So. Um, you know, achieving the other, the next slide, achieving the other rules of the book. Um, you know, one, the big one is, and we there was a question about this, was the grunt fund split. You know, okay, so we put the grunt fund together, and so when do we split it up? When do we end it? And, you know, generally, you know, I think what the book says and basically what I think the template says, what the template says that's on Mike's website, um, the defaults are, you know, everybody agrees that we're going to split up the grunt fund. There is sufficient cash flow from either investment or from operations or a sale of the company. So in terms of an agreement of everyone, you know, that's a, a very fair thing to do. Um, you know, obviously from a legal, legal perspective, the downside is you have somebody who painted, painted the, the office and they have a, a little bit of uh, time in the grunt fund and, and so they, you know, uh, don't want to sell or you can't find them or, you know, whatever the case is. So that can be, there can be a drawback there, but I think it's it's very fair to say, you know, we're not going to cut out this grunt fund, you know, after one person spent, you know, a, a, an insane six months of time and put money in and now, you know, that person's the lead person and um, he's just going to pull the rug out from any, everybody and now we're going to split at 80-20 um, before, you know, everybody else has a chance to catch up. Um, Sufficient cash flow, you know, it's hard to define from operations. Um, you know, I think the best you can really do, I mean, if you don't have a, a strict number in mind, you know, maybe you do if you've run a lot of uh, projections and, and pro formas, you maybe, you maybe you can say, well, as soon as we have, you know, a million dollars of revenue, then we will have, you know, <laughs> sufficient cash flow to pay salaries, and so let's split the grunt fund up at that point. Um, you know, I think generally it's it's hard to define, so it's like it's just a matter of saying sufficient. And if it really comes down to it, and you really get into a lawsuit over it, um, it's it's probably sufficient enough to to make everybody want to spend thousands of dollars on 
on on a, a lawsuit. So you know, it is what it is. But it's at least something that's you know legally enforceable. I would say is is important to have in there. Um, cash flow from investment is a number. Um, you know, it, it's I think a little bit different for everybody. And here's here's what I would here's how I typically frame it. You know, I think the, the the number that you should use for this when you say, and so what are we saying? We're saying if we raise X amount of investment um, from outside investors, we will split up the grunt fund and, and everybody will get their you know equity and we'll move forward on that <coughs> on that basis. What I typically tell people is you should pick the number that is the 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 lowest number that you would you really think that you would actually take. So, you know, um, just depend, I mean, and that number can be so many different things depending on obviously, you know, your company and what you want to do with it and all these sorts of things. For some people, they'd be thrilled to, to have a $50,000 investment from an angel. Um, for some companies, they're not, you know, interested in raising money until they can even, you know, do a Series A. They're not even do, doing, you know, a seed round. So, you know, it just depends on what that level is. And the reason I say that, the reason I advise that, is that um, if you don't reach that level of investment, then what's the default? The default is you have to get everybody to agree. And so, you know, you might have the majority of people that want to take, you know, some amount of investment, but not everybody wants to. And so you need to have in the, you know, in, in the, from a legal perspective, it has to be defined, this is the level of investment at which we are going to, you know, accept um, uh, that, w that we're going to close up shop, close up the grunt fund, split it up, and go our, go our, our separate ways. And it, that all really, that, that entire kind of think, thought process is based on the concept of, if you have a successful company and you're running it in through a grant fund, and you you have investors, um, you could potentially get your investors to participate in the grant fund, right? Their their money is going to be worth four x in the grant fund to your time being worth two x. So, you know that could be a great deal for the investor. On the other hand, I will say that probably there's a lot of um, you know angel investors who would look at that and say say, wait, hold on, you're telling me I'm going to put in my, you know, actual money and you're going to put in time and there could become a point at which your time surpasses my money and dilutes me down. Um, and there's, you know, I think a lot of investors that would say, <clears throat> you know, I'm not interested in doing that. And so at the end of the day, what you have to have is the ability, I think, the ability to take, you know, an investment that is substantial and useful to the company um, without having to get every single person in the grunt fund to agree, right? The amount of investment should be an objective, uh, an objective um, standard that everyone agrees. Yes, if we get this amount of investment, we'll we'll terminate the grunt fund and we'll split up the equity. We'll take the money from the investor. Everyone will be diluted and we'll go from there. So I think that's you know that's generally my thought. And then sale of the company. Again, this actually comes down to. Um, it comes down to a governance question. So again, we go back to the idea of the grunt fund itself is not necessarily a governance um, tool, although it can be used. You know, it can be used that way. Um, and as Mike said, you know, if you have the the dictatorship form of governance, you know, you may be you may lose your team. So you, it's a decision you have to make early on. But at the end of the day, if you want to sell the company, there has to be a vote, right? There has to be a corporate, uh, an internal vote of the stakeholders, and you have to have some mechanism for doing that. And you know, um, it's either got to be something that you set up from, uh, you know, either looking at the grunt fund at the time you're going to make that decision and say, okay, what are the relative percentages, and we'll vote on that basis, or if if somebody reserved the right to vote um, or the right to you know sell the company, then that all has to be set up you know early on in the initial formation. So um, doing it through as a percentage of the grunt fund is simpler and it costs less. Um, Doing it the other way, where you really set it up and <coughs> set up a, a sort of a, a real governance structure, is going to be, you know, obviously more um, um, more certain as to what will happen in, in those cases. Um, and then adding new grunts. So the grunt fund split is one of the rules, you know, that we're achieving, trying to achieve in the of the book. And then the other one is adding new grunts. And you know, generally speaking, I think that's uh, 
in the, in the template that Mike has on his, his site, um, you know, that's a decision that's ruled by um, uh, the grunt leader. So your na if you name a grunt leader, then that person has the ability to hire new people and, and you know, bring them into the grunt fund and allow them to then start earning, um, you know, uh, value within the fund. Um, you know, that said, that's also a decision that could be left to, you know, a vote or, you know, whatever, however you want to do it. But, but I think these are good examples to, sh to say, you know, you have to, I think, have a conversation when you're doing the grunt fund as to how are we going to make these decisions as they go. And if we're going to do them on the basis of the grunt fund, then we're just going to need, need to be on our toes and, and identify, oh, we need to make, you know, one of these kind of major decisions. Um, or, you know, you, you set up an initial governance structure through, you know, who owns what. Um, finally, you know, achieving the other rules of the book. Termination, obviously, there's is given a lot of um, uh, uh, talk in the book, and, and in the template there's a long provision that deals with termination that tracks the book. But, you know, basically what we're, what we're trying to do is be, be fair. And so, you know, there's two ways that a grunt can leave. The grunt can either be fired or can resign. And in either case, there's sort of a different, you know, result based on... Um, the reason that the grunt left, right? So if the grunt resigns or, you know, with, with good reason, meaning, you know, uh, the company moved 100 miles away or the company um, <coughs> um, changed the grunts, you know, the grunt was a marketing grunt and now they're a, a finance grunt um, and, and they don't like that or they don't know anything about it or, you know, whatever the reason was. If it was a good reason, and, and generally those are defined, um, then the grunt, you know, in theory should be treated, you know, better than, than in the situation where the grunt leaves because, um, you know, he just up and quits and just doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, same thing for termination. So if the company has a good reason to, to terminate you because you committed a crime or um, you, uh, you know, you're sleeping on the job or something like that, then, you know, you should be treated less, the grunt should be treated less kindly than in the situation where the company just up and decides, you know what, well, we're just tired of seeing your face around here. You know, you've been doing a good job, but we just kind of don't want you around anymore, and so we're going to fire you um, or get rid of you. So, you know, generally speaking, what these, you know, what these, uh, uh, you know, what this would achieve is <coughs> treating the the quote unquote good lever, you know, more fairly or better than the quote unquote bad lever who you know, either got fired or left, you know, got fired for a good reason or left for no reason, um, uh, you know, and so that's, you know, the, the rules are, you know, generally um, uh, set up in there. But uh, so we had a question about valuing the shares on the way out the door. Um, so I think, you know, the value, I think, is, um, you know, generally... Um, I mean, in the book, I outlined the methods for, you know, if they're leaving for good reason or they've been fired for no good reason, the value should be equal to the, uh, the, the theoretical value of their shares or the actual value if there is one, whichever is higher. Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback from your computer, Clint. Oh, sorry. But if you're let go with four cause, means you get you get fired, or you terminate without cause, you just quit the job, then you would lose your equity for any non-cash inputs, like time and ideas, and you would um, keep a uh, dollar amount equal to your dollar amount you invested. So if you invested $1,000, the company should owe you $1,000 if they can pay you. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think what it says is, you know, like you said, it's really the difference between, you know, your time, um, the the value of your time, um, versus just the hard inputs, right? So if you if you if you are a bad lever, right, you're just entitled to get your your cash. You know, you put ten thousand in, you get your cash back. If you're a if you're a if you're a good lever, then you know you have the ability to get you know, higher value for what you put in, plus your, you know, plus your other inputs, your hard inputs, your cash, um, plus you get this, the clawback if you, if the company is sold within a year, um, you know, which is, which is very nice, and then, 
Um, you know, either way, I think if the company doesn't have the ability to pay you out, then it can um, you you can retain your equity, but you don't you don't have the the ability to vote. Um, so I think generally that's it. But I think that's important. It's important for people to really read that sec those sections of the book and understand, you know, what that all says, because um, it could become important. And obviously, at a at a situation in a situation where you're getting rid of somebody, you know, even if it's when it's quote unquote amicable, everybody, you know, the deal you make is the deal you make, and um, you'll be, you know, both sides will expect uh, that to be honored and. Um, to avoid issues and lawsuits and all sorts of problems in the future with due diligence things when somebody leaves and you know doesn't sign the right things and doesn't go and now now there's a question you're going to raise some money and now there's a question whether that person you know had intellectual property or whatever it's important to just sort of have this this structure in place um, so that's really it uh, you know it's a general overview of sort of the legal and you know, a tax kind of um, questions that that you know I think I see most often and, and generally how I'm um, viewing them and um, happy to take uh, you know a few more questions. Uh, looks like we have a question here. Does a limited partnership structure in Canada approach what you've been describing as an LLC? Do you know much about a Canadian law, Clint? Uh, I have no idea. Mike might Mike might have a Canadian lawyer. I don't. I don't know. Do you? No. I, no. I honestly don't know. There's been a couple that have tried, that have tried but uh, they haven't really followed through. But uh, I don't. I'm, I've heard about what you're talking about. I don't know the details about an L and a limited partnership. Partnership. Um, so just just for reference, uh, so the question was whether the the Canadian limited partnership kind of looks looks and feels like an LLC. Right. Right. You know, I think so. Just to give you the the basic sketch of an LLC. An LLC has, you know, owners which are called members and um, it also would have uh, managers and so the managers are, you know, the, the ones, they can be members or non-members and they're the ones who are, you know, entitled to, to run the company, operate it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, appoint officers, make the, make the big decisions, etc. <coughs> um, and the members are, you know, for all intents and purposes, have nothing, you know, all they do is hold their ownership. They don't, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, by default, they're not um, allowed to make business decisions, they're not allowed to contract, like sign contracts for the company, enter into transactions for the company. They have to be specifically authorized to do that. Um, and the, the members are the ones who, you know, uh, it's, it's similar to, here in the U.S., a limited partnership, which has a general partnership and limited part, you know, has a general partner and a limited partner. The general partner is the one that, you know, is supposed to operate for the company, and the limited partner is the one that really just holds an ownership interest and doesn't do anything. Um, you know, obviously, in our scenario, in an LLC, all the members are going to be doing things, um, are going to be rendering services to the company, but the governance structure is going to be such that only a ma only a manager. Um, and that's that's a default. Um, it's a state you know state law LLC act type of rule. Um, you know the manager is the one that has the authority to you know deal on behalf of um, uh, of the company, but it's the members that own a hundred percent. And again, the manager does not have to be a member. So the members own all the the equity. Um, the the manager has sort of all the power, and the manager is appointed by the members. I don't know if that helps at all, but that's kind of a general description of LLCs uh, here in the U.S. Another question is, what is the difference for an LLC reallocating percentage ownership to match the grant fund and a grant fund split? What is the difference between an LLC and a corporation? Or does it really say? Reallocating percentage ownership to match the grant fund. Is there, is so the the issue, you know, like as we discussed, an LLC by default is taxed as a partnership. You can actually make it, you can make an election with the IRS and have it taxed as a corporation, but by default it's taxed as a partnership. And in partnership tax, you can reallocate um, percentage interests among the owners however you want. Now there are other tax effects to doing that, but and there are rules and things you have to follow that are way beyond the scope of, of what we're talking about here. But um, you can do that in an LLC that's taxed as a partnership, and um, 
there's no immediate tax effect necessarily like there would be in terms of income tax to the to the members there's there doesn't need to be an, an immediate tax effect um, like there is like there would be if you did that in a corporation if you started reallocating shares that and assuming the company has value if you start doing that in a corporation those shares have value and so the, the owners who are getting more shares would be treated as having received compensation in an LLC there's a way to you know, you, you can structure it so that you don't have that issue. <laughs> okay, it's about 4 o'clock. That'll be our last question. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, Clint. And uh, this webinar will be made available later via recording. Great, thank you very much. Signing off.